going. Starting a little early tonight. I figured I'd get my hellos in while we're uh, we're still waiting on some people to come in here. Hey Gray, how's it going? How was the Taco Bell? The Taco Bell was good, man. I pigged out. They've got a uh, a double quesarito box, so I went with that. It's pretty good. How's it going, Davey? I know you and Gray are a fan of the bananas. That sounded perverted, didn't it? Can't see anything. One minute, one minute countdown. We're getting this show on the road. There's everybody. Hey, Tinfoil. Hey, Nate Dog. I wish my YouTube videos were better than yours, Davey. I really do. I don't have the patience to edit a video for a week. I wish I had that patience. All right, my people, it is eight o'clock. Hey, Reezer. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so tonight, no PowerPoint presentation. We're gonna be diving right into everything. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing all enumeration today. So uh, last time we did scanning, we didn't really talk about what we were doing with the scanning, just looking for open ports. Today, we're going to be doing uh, enumeration on what we find on open ports. In the next week, we're actually going to be doing exploitation. So it's starting to pick up, get a little fun here. We'll cover for the people who don't subscribe to the mailing list or aren't on the emails. Uh, we'll cover briefly what we're doing tonight here as soon as I switch screens. So we'll be doing some enumeration on Chaotrix, which we've done before in the past. And we're going to be doing some random hack the box machines. We're just going to select one out of out of the blue that's active and we'll do some enumeration without exploitation. Uh, that way we don't break any rules. A little scanning never hurt anybody. So on top of that, uh, I was streaming earlier and was asked, why hasn't there been a giveaway recently? And that's a great question. So got another giveaway coming. It's a bash bunny. So we are giving away my bash bunny tonight. If you need a uh, refresher, I'll give you a refresher really quick on what we're doing. So when we talk about giveaways, let's bring this over here. So 
see if I can bring it over. And let me do this. Okay. So if you look at my screen, you see that I have the giveaway set up. We're going to be doing a command of raffle and then the amount of tickets you want to buy. We're doing a 500 uh, on the cost tonight for the tickets because this Bash Bunny is $100 and is really not even used. So you're basically getting a brand new Bash Bunny. Uh, 500 on the cost. You can buy up to 200 tickets. Nobody has that much money, which means all of you can buy as many tickets as you can afford. Um, again, on this, if you are a subscriber, your luck goes up uh, to two. And if you're a regular, your luck goes up to two. So I don't remember what the regular is. We go into currency. Uh... A regular is at 2,000 points or more. So if you've got more than 2,000 points, you are a regular. Uh, if you don't, then you are not a regular. Uh, ways to get points. Again, just as a quick reminder, if you are a follower, if you're not a follower, all you got to do is hit the follow button. You get 200 free points. If you're a subscriber, you get 1,000 free points. And then you get 10 points for every so many minutes that you're here. Uh, so the longer you watch, it pays the people who actually sit here and watch is, is really what it's for, the giveaways. Um, so we'll be doing that at the end of the stream before the AMA, and hopefully a, another lucky winner gets uh, something cool tonight. So with that being said, we are going to dive right into uh, our enumeration tonight. So. We are going to be scanning Keatrix level one, which I sent out an email that you guys needed to be downloading. Uh, so if you've got Keatrix up, it should have, if you're, I'm running a VMware player so that I'm running the same as you guys. Um, you should have two players open essentially. If I drag this over, your Keatrix should look something like this, where it says level one penetration testing and assessment environment. You got the Keatrix login and you're stuck in this box. You just hit control alt at the same time to escape. After that, we're going to be going into hack the box. And we are going to pick a random box out of here. If you've never used hack the box before, then this may be uh, something for you. Hey, look, Davey's team's up here in the top teams. Congrats, Davey. I didn't know that. Uh, so anyway, We'll come in here. We're going to access. I'll show you guys how to do that if you've never done Hack the Box before. Um, if you haven't signed up for Hack the Box, you're probably not going to be able to do it tonight. It does require a little bit of hackery to get in, um, but that's okay. You can work on that in a later time. Just follow along with what we're doing and the reasoning behind it. So tonight we're going to be talking mainly about enumeration. Enumeration is the most important thing that you're going to be doing in... Uh, anything hacking related. So if you don't know how to enumerate, if you aren't patient with your enumeration, you're not going to be a good hacker and you're not going to be successful in the field. That's not your team. I thought that was your team. My bad. Sorry, guys. All right. So as I was saying, you won't be successful in this field if you don't know how to enumerate. So this is why we're taking it in baby steps. Last week, we talked about scanning. This week, we're talking about just enumeration. We're not going to dive into anything exploitation until at least next week. That way, you can kind of understand what the process is. Now, I'm not going to show you tonight how to do every single port, how to enumerate, what tools those are. I'm going to leave that up to you. That's your, your challenge is to go figure out how you would enumerate certain ports. I'm going to show you my process, which holds true for any port that I'd be looking up, any service, etc. Uh, so with that process, you should be able to take that and move on and do any box that you see, at least from an enumeration uh, aspect. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to take myself off of this screen. I'm going to make this full screen here. Okay. Okay. And now what we're going to be doing, first and foremost, we're going into a terminal. And we are going to do a net discover 
dash r. Also, I need my I need a new tab here because I don't know my IP address. So we'll say if config. Let's find your IP address. So my IP address is 192.168.202.129. I'm just going to copy the first three octets. We'll do a dash R for range, paste, 0 slash 24. If this does not make sense, we are doing a, a discovery uh, via ARP through this range. That's what dash R is for. We're specifying a dot zero and we're scanning the entire subnet of a slash 24. If you are weak on subnetting or understanding what this is, you may need to brush up on your networking skills. So we're doing the sweep. Remember that my IP is 129. Uh, I expect dot one and dot two to be active. I expect dot two five four to be active. Those are active by default. But the one that really stands out to me is this dot. 130. So this is our Keoptrix machine. At least this is my Keoptrix machine. So I'm going to show you this tonight from my perspective, how I would focus on this machine if I were a pen tester. I'm not going to focus on this as if it were a capture the flag. I want to talk about all the details that I would look at and what I would be seeing. Uh, we're going to talk about how I would report findings, what findings I would report at least up until a certain point before we even exploit anything. So there's a lot of information and details that you can gather without ever having to run an exploit. Another thing that you should have up for tonight is that we're going to be running our keep note. If you've got cherry tree, that's fine. I've started a brand new keep note for Keoptrix. We're going to do it like I would do for work um, in a work related setting in the sense that this is going to be uh, we'll call this probably an external assessment. Uh, it could more likely be an uh, internal assessment, but we'll just we'll write it out where we create some subcategories here and we actually take screenshots and notate exactly what we're doing. That way we take good notes and we have something going forward so that way you guys have uh, notes later on in the class. Uh, somebody asked... If you booted your Captrix VM, do you just need to leave it or do you need to log in and do something with it? There is no login. Uh, you just need to leave it. We're going to try to hack it. So good question. Okay. So as a pen tester, we're going to do a couple things. And we covered this last week. First and foremost, we're probably going to be firing up Nessus. So let's log in to our Nessus server. If you installed it last week, if not, then um, go back and look at how to install install Nessus and run that. You can just follow along from the Nmap portion of it. So we're going to do a new scan. We're going to do a basic network scan. API access is disabled. Why do they hate me, guys? Did we pay for Nessus? No, we didn't pay for Nessus. This is a free trial which allows you to uh, do up to 16 hosts at one time. So um, actually, paste the IP there. We'll just call this Keoptrix. We'll call this description Keoptrix as well. And what we're doing is we're going to come into discovery. We're going to select port scan all ports. Go into assessment. We'll leave assessment default. We're not going to scan for all web vulnerabilities. We'll scan for known web vulnerabilities. How about that? That'll be quick. And then reporting's fine. Advanced is fine. We'll save that. And we're just going to go ahead and hit launch. We're going to let this run. We can click on it and kind of watch it go as it picks up vulnerabilities or, or other issues. So you can see it already. It's picked up SMB. We'll let this run while we um, 
while we go and do our nmap scans. So let's minimize that. Let's go ahead and take a look at nmap now. I'm gonna make this one more bigger. Okay, and we're gonna nmap this guy. We're just gonna say T4. We're gonna say all ports and we're going to, I don't remember if I still have it on copy and paste. I do. Okay, so we're gonna enter in the IP address and just hit enter. Now, does anybody remember from last week what I'm doing here? Can somebody tell me what I'm doing here? Just as a little Q&A reminder. What did I leave off? And what did I leave off intentionally is the question. Yes, I'm running an MF scan. Thank you, Gray. Yep, we left off. We left off the A. Thanks, Jake. So intentionally left off the switch of A. We don't want to scan for all on all ports. We want to do some stage scanning here. So now that we have this information, we can tab back up. We can come out wherever you want to put it, dash A. And then you can put your ports in here that you found. Something like this. And I'm going to hit enter on that. And we'll let this run. It shouldn't take too, too long uh, because we are in a direct network and this is um, not scanning, say, a website over, over a network, for example. So we'll wait for this to, to populate. Let's hit the up arrow, 99% on the NSE. We'll check in on our Nessus as well. Oh, we're getting all kinds of fun stuff. So many things. All the things. There's so much stuff. Let's see if it's done scanning. It's still going. We're at 99% though. I also hate the grouping feature. I It sh just came through a, an update not that long ago, and I really don't like it because I like to be able to see uh, and sort by the criticals. So I'm not a big fan of this. I can change it on the interface. Oh, my man. All right, I'm here. I'm on hosts. Click bones. All right, how am I changing this? Configure, not configure. Click count. Counts just sorting. We'll come back to it. Check our scan here. So the scanning takes a little bit to get through, and this is pretty common. So like we were talking about last week, uh, automating your scans is always a good idea. So if you know that you have to scan at 8 o'clock in the morning, setting up your email to say, hey, um, client, I'm going to be scanning you, you fire that off at 8 o'clock in the morning, and you also fire your scan off which if we went into configure, there was a schedule in here. We can come in here and enable that schedule and tell it exactly when to start and it would do it on time for us. So any sort of automation that you can do with this to save time is definitely helpful. And we can start looking through some of the things while we're waiting. We're still picking up a bunch of vulnerabilities. We've got open SSL issues. We've got Apache HTTP issues. Looks like there's going to be a web server. So if you come down and you look for service detection, this is one of the more important things to look at. So it tells us what kind of services it found. So it found 
Um, it found a SSH server. It found a web server and found another web server running on 443. It did note that it found SMB as well. And I'm looking to see if there's anything else. So it provides you all kinds of information. Like it says OS identification. Uh, it's going to try to identify the type of OS that's running. It says Linux kernel 2.4. That may or may not be correct. A lot of times that's a false positive. And before we dive into this, so there's a mod SSL remote over or uh, yeah, buffer overflow here. I want to get to the end map before we dive too deep into the Nessus, but the end map's taking its sweet time. So, okay, we do know that there is a, we know that there is a um, web server out there. And of course, as soon as I'm getting ready to, to move on, it just comes through. Okay, let's take a look at the scan. So we've got port 22 open, that's SSH. And it gives us a little bit of information here on the version. We've got open SSH 2.9 P2. We've got a web server sitting on port 80. It also gives us a version of Apache HTTP D 1.3.20. Also says that it's running Red Hat Linux mod SSL 2.8.4 open SSL 0.9.6B. Identifies a trace method. And identifies the server, which it already did once, but it's got that as well. And it says test page for Apache web server on Red Hat Linux. Okay. Uh, 111 here, RPC bind. Typically we see RPC bind when we have, uh, we have 139, we have Samba or SMB open. So that is a common pairing here. So we've got 139 open. We've got SMB. 443 looks like it's the exact same thing as the port 80. Uh, we'll have to give it a look and see exactly what we see. And then we've got this 32768. Uh, also looks like it's an RPC bind of some sort because you can see the RPC here. Uh, so we scroll down. It gives a best guess of what kind of Linux it is. Linux 2.4. This is not always accurate. This is just its best attempt. Uh, it comes down here and it does SMB. It looks at it, tries to identify what type of SMB it is. It doesn't really identify. Um, it does identify a host name of Keoptrix. Okay, it doesn't know a user. Um, doesn't tell us really anything about uh, anything. So this is where having multiple scanners comes into play because I, there's already things about this SMB that I noticed that in the Nessa scan that's not showing up in this scan. So as a pen tester, I'm going to be looking for the low hanging fruit. If this was on the external web server, um, the first thing I want to be looking for is uh, port 80. I want to see what they're running on port 80 or port 443. Uh, I also want to know why they have SSH and uh, why they have 139 open. Now, if this is on the internal, okay, uh, 139 opens, not as big of a deal. We know why, because they're likely using a file share. And uh, SSH, okay, they may remotely administer the machine in some way or another. So these would be bigger concerns if this were on um, an external network. Same thing with, if you see something like RDP on an external network, that's something that you would be, uh, okay, why is that there? You know, uh, internally, again, not as big of a deal. There's vulnerabilities that we can exploit, and we're going to get into that when we get into internal exploitation when it comes to 139. Um, but we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. So low-hanging fruit, in the order that I would look at this, I would probably look at this at either port 80 first, uh, 443 is included in that, or 139 as well mainly because there's a ton of SMB vulnerabilities out there that lead to remote code execution. There is also a ton of vulnerabilities out there uh, that are web related. So if we're doing a network pen test, we need to make sure that when we go out to these websites, and we talked about this last week, that we're not doing a web app assessment. We're not gonna be looking around for anything and everything. We're looking for some sort of direct win. 
If there's a login page, we might try to brute force the login page. If there is uh, a login page, we might try to do SQL injection. But we're not looking for like cross-site scripting or we're not going to report back on um, certain headers being missing and things like that. But let's go and just navigate to the page. So our first step of enumeration is we're just going to go take a peek at what the page looks like. So again, we are sitting at 192.168.202.130. I'm just going to copy that. Okay, Apache test page. I just want to see what it looks like on the HTTPS side. Just say advance, add the exception. You can confirm the exceptions. Also a test page. Okay. So for me, this is finding number one. You've got a default test page on out in the open. So there are multiple issues here with this. It's not a critical finding. It's a low finding. But issue number one is we're giving away information, right? We've got that it's powered by Apache. We've got that it's powered by Red Hat. Okay, so now we're giving out server information of what type of uh, framework we're running, what type of uh, operating system we're probably running on. Um, on top of that, it just signals that this client here might have poor hygiene. If they're running a default test page out on the, on the web, why are they doing that? Is it because they forgot to take it offline? Did they just leave it up? Or are they running a server... Um, somewhere on this IP address, but they forgot to take down the desk page. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of misconfigurations. So what you're looking at here is you're saying, okay, if you're an attacker, from the attacker point of view, you say, I see a test page, that's poor hygiene. If they're leaving this sort of misconfiguration just out in the open, what other sort of misconfigurations are out there? So we're going to go ahead and notate this, uh, this issue. So what we'll do is we'll come into here and I'll make a child page and we'll just call this uh, vulnerabilities. And then we'll make a new child page. And we'll say default web page and we'll just call this low. So we want to identify a couple things. We want to identify if we're doing multiple IP addresses, we'll identify um, we'll identify which IP address it's tied to. Like if we're scanning a network, a subnet of like a slash twenty four, um, we'll we'll use uh, the specific IP address we found it on. So in this case, and I keep forgetting it because I'm not typing it out one nine two one six eight two zero two one thirty. So we'll notate the IP address. Uh, we might put some sort of notes in here for ourselves if it's uh, not self-explanatory, but this one is pretty self-explanatory. And somebody asked what the uh, what the note-taking application is. This is Keep Note. So it runs on Mac and on Windows, I believe, or it runs on Linux and Windows. I don't remember which, but it definitely runs on Windows. Okay, so we're also going to use our screenshot tool, which is GreenShot. Let's minimize this. I'm going to take a screenshot here of the test page. What I like to do is I like to get in here and I like to make sure the IP address is in there. Um, it doesn't have to be the whole test page. It could just be something like this. And this might even be too long, to be honest with you. Um, you might need to shrink it down just for reporting measures. But come in here, you say open an image editor. And I'm going to drag this over so you guys can see it. I like to make it pretty. So I like to come in here and I like to add a border. So like it gives it a nice little border in here. And um, some other cool little things. I know we've covered note taking before, but uh, if I want to highlight something like say, OK, test page, I want to highlight that, that it's a test page. I'll do that. If I need to highlight the IP address, I can do that. Uh, there's obfuscation in here as well. If I need to blur something out, we can also do that. Um, so I'll just hit the copy button over here. Copy the image to the clipboard. 
come back into our note taking application and I'll just paste it into here. All right, so that is our very first finding. So we see here that we have our test page. Um, I mean, we could, if it were a real website, we could view the source and see if there's anything in the comments or, you know, um, something off of the source code. But since it's a test page, pretty much nothing going on here. So when we have port 80, we've got some things that we can use, some tools that we can use built into Kali uh, that allow us to enumerate. And we talked about this last week. This is number one is Nikto. So let me clear the screen. We're going to run Nikto on this host. So you do a Nikto dash H for host. And then you just type in 192.168.202.130 and hit enter. And you're going to see it's just flying through already with all sorts of information. So again, if we look at Nikto, it's pulling a server header from a response header here, and it's pulling Apache 1.3.20. That is going to be a finding. Um, usually I'll go into Burp Suite and take you take like a, uh, a screenshot, like a prettier screenshot. I probably won't take it from, from this here. Uh, we're also seeing the mod SSL again. It's leaking E tags. That's not something I would typically put in an external finding. Um, that's just kind of nitpicky. And the same goes with these. These are findings for a web app assessment, but they're not findings for uh, an external assessment unless for some reason we have found absolutely nothing and we need to put something on the report. Uh, but typically we'll find a little bit of information and especially tonight we're gonna find a lot of information. So we look at this and you've got these, these headers that are missing, right? The anti-click jacking, the cross-site scripting protection, the content type. Um, so we're not going to worry too much about those. We're not going to worry too much about this cross-site scripting. Again, this is not a web app assessment. But we do worry about SSL. This open SSL appears to be vulnerable. This mod SSL appears to be vulnerable. Apache 1.3.20 appears to be vulnerable. And it's going through and kind of doing a little vulnerability scan for us. So these are all things that we're going to want to look into and do some research on to see what the vulnerabilities are that exist and um, how we can look those up. What what can we use to our advantage? What kind of vulnerabilities are they? Are they denial of service vulnerabilities? Because like say this remote denial of service. Yeah, that's something we're going to report, but that's not going to be something that we're going to be able to act upon because most of the time denial of service is out of scope when we're doing these sorts of assessments. Um, but it's definitely something we would notate saying it's vulnerable. So we'll we'll get back to that in a little bit. We'll scroll through the rest of this. Um, we see the allowed HTTP methods and get head options. Those are all fine. Trace is, it's a little risky to have trace on, but only if we were able to find some sort of cross-site scripting, um, then trace becomes cross-site tracing. So again, this is nitpicky on a uh, an external assessment. If we were doing a web app assessment, maybe we'd throw this in there. So we come into here, and what else we see? We see that it does a little dir busting, and we've got the usage manual, manual. Okay, so it's it's found some directories for us that maybe we might want to look at, um, but we're gonna do our own dir busting here as well. So now we've got a whole list of information that we can go on. And now I'm going to blow this up. Question is, would I normally pipe this out to a text file? So there is a HTML version of Nikto that's out there. Or you can save it out to an HTML and make it way more readable than this. Uh, we'd have to look at the options, but that is something that is possible. So yeah, you can make it look cleaner if you're if you're not comfortable reading it in this sort of method. So let's go ahead and run durbuster. All you do is type in durbuster like that. Okay, 
so now it's going to ask us for a few things. And all we're doing is we're doing brute force, uh, brute forcing the directories. So we're just looking for any type of file or directory that we can find that we're just not seeing right away. Uh, we could also crawl the web page with something like uh, Burp Suite, like we did last week when we were looking at Tesla. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and just look for directories while we wait, especially on a page that's like a test page like this. We uh, we we want to dig in and see maybe there's a hidden directory, and I have found hidden directories on default web pages before. So and they had like um, like directories hidden back there that were just full of data and information that shouldn't have been on the web anyway. I think they just thought they were hiding it for whatever reason. Um, but they weren't really, you know, they weren't really good about it. So we'll copy this. Uh, we'll copy the HTTP one. It doesn't really matter. Just paste it into here. Make sure you have the correct syntax HTTP. And then I'm going to put the port 80 like it has. It asks about number of threads. I always click go faster. And it's a uh, now it's asking us for a file list. So it wants to be able to know what sort of word list it's going to run through. And I'll show you where the common word list is. So if you click on browse and you say look in, we're going to go back a directory. And we're going to go to user. We're going to go to share right here. We're going to scroll all the way over until we see word list. And there is a folder in here called Durbuster. We'll just double click on that. And we've got options in here. So we've got quite a few just for proof of concept. We've got this directory list, lowercase, small. This is plenty. Uh, we could run the medium. And if we actually went out to GitHub, there is a large version as well. I've used the large version on assessments where I've got quite a bit of time just to run that. So we'll just go ahead and select this small here. OK, so we're going to brute force directories. We're going to brute force files. We're going to be recursive, meaning we're going to if we find a directory, we're going to try to scan that next directory as well. Um, and now it's going to ask about file extensions. So we know we're running an Apache server, so we're going to be using PHP as a file extension. Uh, if this were an IIS server, we'd be using ASP, ASPX, ASM, ASMX, um, those types of extensions. On top of this, outside, outside of this PHP, um, we should look at other things as well. So we should be looking for any kind of interesting file that would be there. So we could say um, PHP, we could say ASA, uh, what else? SQL, zip file, ATAR file, PDF, text file, back file this adds right so imagine every time that we add something here we are adding that list all over again so we're going to go through the list for blanks we're going to go through the list for every single one of these uh, file extensions as well but it's always good to look through this just to see if you find anything of interest that's hidden out there So we're going to go ahead and hit start on this guy. And that's going to run in the background. That'll take some time. It gives you a pretty good time estimate here. So uh, it's got 18 minutes. And the more directories that it finds, you could see like it's already finding a list view. If we click onto the list view, it's already starting to find directories. Uh, and then if we went into the tree view, you can kind of look at it a little easier. So it's found this usage, it's found uh, manual, doc, and it just depends what actually comes in here. So we could actually stop some of these. Like if we found icons, we could just stop icons or stop docs if we weren't interested in seeing that. Um, there's this usage page here, which gave us a 200 response code, meaning that it's, uh, you know, it's 
a success. So we could open that in the browser and see what's there. So it looks like they have some sort of monthly statistics on their, their page. Who knows if we were actually supposed to find this information or not. Um, and then it shows you the different, um, the different URLs that have been accessed here. So this is a, a little bit of information disclosure as well. So it would depend on um, what we actually found in this page, whether or not we would actually report this and whether or not this should be something that a non-administrative user should be able to see. Uh, my guess would be no, that you should not be able to see these sorts of things. Uh, but you would want to talk to the, you know, you'd want to talk to somebody on the other team and say, is there a reason this is out on the web unauthenticated? Um, and they may have some decent reason for it. So you can see that there's pages here uh, that came out with nothing. But so that's interesting. Uh, there's all these pages back here as well. There's a web server, 200. You can open that in the browser, MRTG. And we just keep digging and keep digging here, right? So we'll let this run and see what else comes up. But the whole point and everything that we're doing right now is we're just, we're just enumerating, right? So all we're looking to do is, um, is dig as deep as we can until we can find any sort of useful information. And we're gonna to try to report on everything that we can find that is relevant. That way we can improve the client security posture um, and we can feel like we did a good job as well. And thank you for the sub. I just saw that come through, I appreciate that. Okay, so. While this runs, let's go ahead and take a look at something. So we've seen the server header pop up a few times. I actually kind of want to look at that. I just want to see what the response header is when we make a request. So let's go ahead and just use, we can use a tool called curl. We could do a dash dash head like this. And we could say 192.168.202.130. Okay, so now we've got some, um, some disclosure here, information disclosure, right? We absolutely have a server tag in here, server header in here with Apache listed. Uh, we've got the mod SSL as well. You know, this just keeps coming up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a screenshot of this and we're gonna report this as well. So let's go ahead and just do a new page and we'll say server header info disclosure. Copy that, paste it. And I'm going to show you a new trick with this as well. So once we get the screenshot, let's open this in image editor. I'm going to bring this over. All right. For the purpose of making our reports look good and for the purpose of not wasting ink, this black background here is awful. We can come into this little tab over here and say invert and then we could turn that into white. This looks much, much better on reports. It saves you ink. Uh, it's an all around win-win. So nifty little trick right here on the little magic hat. Uh, faxes as well, somebody said, if you're faxing your reports. Um, I would probably highlight this server here. Also e tags while not serious is an information disclosure that we can highlight. As always, I like to put my pretty little border on it. And we'll say copy, come into here. We'll paste this information. Okay. 
So I saw a comment come through saying that we should check for error pages as well. I agree. So you come in here, 404, and what do you know? There's another finding. So on top of the header disclosure, they're also doing information disclosure as well with their 404 page. They're using the generic Apache 404, not found, instead of having their own 404 page. So this as well would be a finding. So we'll come back in here, make another finding. Also, this info disclosure is all, this is low. We'll say 404, default 404 info disclosure. And honestly, when we, um, when we come through here and we have enough info disclosures like this, you might just throw them into one finding altogether. Um, so it depends if I've seen it where if I've had a bunch of them, I'll just put them into it. If I've only got like one or two, I'll probably make them separate findings. Um, but if they're doing it all over the place with information disclosure, you might just throw it in and have a bunch of screenshots of all the locations they're doing it. So it just depends. So again, we'll copy the IP address just to be consistent and we'll take a quick screenshot of that. Bring this over again. And we're just gonna put a border and just copy this. We could highlight down here the disclosure as well. Copy and paste. All right. So now, what else can we look into? Um, before we dig into the heavy, the heavy hitting stuff, I want to show you one more thing that we already covered last week. And then we'll start digging into the uh, the heavier exploity type things. All right. So last week we talked about uh, we talked about Nmap and we talked about ciphers and certificates. Um, when we come into Nessus and we looked at this, let's see if this scan is done. Uh, yeah, we are a hundred percent on this. Okay. So we come into here and we'll see that there's a lot of issues, uh, with certificates and you can kind of come through, like see this SSL drown attack. Um, that's a sign or not certificate, sorry, of ciphering. Uh, that's a sign of a, a cipher issue. This SSL, even though it's a low is a sign of a cipher issue. If we click into some of these, like this SSL here, uh, certificate cannot be trusted, uh, expiry, wrong host name. There's all kinds of certificate issues that we would look into. Uh, you would look into some of these other ones as well, like the weak cipher suite supported, the bar mitzvah, uh, Poodle's another big one, uh, et cetera. So we're not going to go too heavy into those because this is just overwhelming with this, but I'll tell you what we do in terms of finding. This is absolutely a finding, and we're going to just kind of um, use a, a generic way of reporting this tonight. But what we've built out um, is an Excel document basically that we can parse Nessus into, and then it reports back all the SSL issues for all the, the servers that are out there, the web servers that are out there, um, and gives you a nice overview because a lot of these attacks, uh, like Poodle or Bar Mitzvah, they require some sort of man in the middle. Uh, they require an extensive amount of time, and they're just not easy attacks to pull off. So they're not something that you would typically go after in an assessment, but they're definitely things that you would notate in an assessment because you're not going to waste, if you're given 40 hours, you're not going to waste all your time trying to um, you know, do a man in the middle attack on, on an external assessment, if that makes sense. Uh, so... The one way we're going to notate this is we're going to use Nmap. 
And there are websites out there that do this for you, like Qualys SSL does this for you. Um, if the site is live, but the site is not live. And I actually like the, I like the Nmap output better, but I've seen it go uh, both ways. All right, so the script that we ran last week was this guy. nmap dash s script equals SSL enum ciphers port 443. Then we're going to say 192.168.202.130. Hit enter. It's going to come back with all the ciphers. Now, Keoptrix is an old box. Um, when Keoptrix came out, maybe these ciphers were on the A side of things. Uh, but now, seeing that it's so old, these ciphers are deprecated. Uh, and last week, when we looked at this, we looked at Tesla, and you saw that Tesla was nothing but A's. Uh, you see here that it's mostly F's. So the best one that they have looks like, like it's a D. And if we scroll down to the bottom, what's really important to capture is the, the cipher least strength. And we'll, we'll basically just grab that um, in and give it a screenshot of it and just put that. Uh, so let's do that real quick. We'll come in here and make a new page. We'll just say weak ciphers. Uh, somebody mentioned the tool test SSL.sh. I have never used that, but we'll have to check it out. Okay, same thing. We'll just make a really quick screenshot. Come in here, we will invert it, border it, capture the least strength as an F. Copy that. And as I said before, we uh, we typically will report this a little differently. We'll do this on like a web app assessment if we're, if we're reporting like a Qualys or this least strength via Nmap. Uh, for an external assessment, especially if we've got a bunch of web servers that we're looking against, we'll build out a chart and it's a lot prettier. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you that chart because that's, uh, a non-disclosure on my behalf, but just know that you can chart these all out. All right, so from here, let's just go ahead and dive into the weeds. I'm gonna take a drink really quick. All right, so we've got a few things that we see. We've seen this Apache 1.3.20 come up a bunch of times. We've seen mod SSL 2.8.4 come up a bunch of times and this open SSL as well. If we go into our Nessus scan, it's all over the place in there. Open SSL has a critical vulnerability um, and it's got several high vulnerabilities and medium as well. So we can assume automatically that this open SSL version is outdated, has lots of vulnerabilities, and um, is going to be something that we're going to be reporting on. So depending what we find uh, is what we're going to report. As of right now, it, we haven't exploited anything, so we don't know how we're going to report this. It's potentially that it's outdated, but we're not able to exploit, and we'll notate that in the report. We'll say, hey, it's outdated. Uh, you need to patch this, but we are unable to actually achieve any sort of um, exploit with this this vulnerability or this um, outdated software. Uh, same thing if we look at Apache. It looks like Apache has several issues as well. Um, just from the Nessus scan itself, it's got denial of service, cross-site scripting, a local overflow, a remote overflow. Uh, it caught the e-tag information disclosure that we talked about. Uh, found a 403 error page. So 
just some things there. It's got some information on the open SSH. So it looks like this open SSH version they're running also has vulnerabilities. Um, so that would be interesting. If we're doing an assessment of this company, we're, our mouth is salivating because there's just so many things that are popping up. It doesn't mean that they're all valid. Sometimes false positives do show up. Um, but when you see this many things going on through these reports, uh, it really starts to get juicy. So look through there. There's some SSL or web server issues. Um, again, open SSH, 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 Apache mod SSL. So we'll dig through these as well um, if we're looking. But what I like to do, even with this sort of information, is I like to do it kind of actually on the manual side of things. So if we've got Apache 1.3.20, for example, the first thing I'll do is I'll go out to Google. Somebody said the gear is, ah, this gear. Disable groups. Hell yeah, that's better. So we can sort by severity. And now you can see all the issues that we really have with this server. There's quite a few, mostly pertaining to OpenSSL or OpenSSH. Thanks for that. All right, so first one, we wanted to look at Apache 1.3.20. And we can look up um, we can look up the CVE details if we look into this. A great, great, great website that's going to become your friend if you stick into this field is ExploitDB. Um, it looks like somewhere in here it was mentioned, so we might open this as well. Uh, but this looks like it pertains to mod SSL 2.8.7 or less. And if we see over here, we do have mod SSL 2.8.4. Um, so this may even be something that's lining up with multiple conditions. So if we see, okay, it requires Apache 1.3.20 and mod SSL 2.8.7 or less, um, then we're starting to meet those kinds of conditions, right? So this might be an exploit that we might be interested in. Um, keep looking through here, 1.3.20, this is another exploit. So let's start with the CVE details. I like to look by score. So the, the higher the number, the better. Um, it looks like there's a ton of vulnerabilities for this. Um, so if we come into here, let me try to blow this up so you guys can see it. Okay. So we've got the score here, and it's got the CVE by number, but um, basically the closer to 10 we get, the juicier this is of an exploit. And you can kind of read what they do. Like this one's a 7.8. Um, it's a denial of service attack. So not something we're going to be able to do, but we know that it exists. Same thing through a lot of these, or a lot of these are de denial of service. Cross-site scripting, we've seen that a few times. Uh, really, we want some sort of execution, like a code overflow here. Any kind of remote code execution that we can get would be great. Um, so those are the types of things we want to look for. Also, when we're on this exploit DB, let me zoom in. So this is the mod SSL 2.8.7. Uh, we would come in here and read through the code to see. A lot of times they tell you, hey, this is exactly what it affects. Um, sometimes they just give you the code like this. Let's see. What we can do if we scroll down. Okay, so it looks like it actually is vulnerable, vulnerable for quite a few things. Let's see if there's notes in here at all for this. So depending on the system architecture and what's running, they have um, different addresses. So I did see Apache 1.3.20. 
So it would have to line up that it's Apache 1.3.20, and we're assuming that we're running some sort of Red Hat Linux, which it does have Red Hat Linux in here. Uh, so this may be something that we're interested in, especially with the fact that we have that, that mod SSL condition as well. So this is something that we would save um, we would save for later. And some of you are getting a little bit ahead of me. So yeah, it is Exploit City over here. There are quite a few exploits with this machine. Um, somebody asked, do we normally see so many vulnerabilities in a website? No, we, we typically don't see this many vulnerabilities. This is a... This is a beginner machine built many years ago, so I, I even think that there's vulnerabilities on this machine that uh, the creator didn't even know existed at the time. That's how old this machine is. So, um, we could look at this as well. Let's see if this one has any info on it. Apache HTTP server allows people to get a directory listing of a directory if it's enabled in the config, even if the index file is present. Uh, so you saw you saw the the many 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 lines like that. This is looks like what was going on. Um, we can copy this and see if this is actually there. But we saw that earlier when we were looking at that statistics page, if you recall correctly, and maybe it wasn't going to that address. I'm not sure what was happening. No, oh, it's trying to, it was trying to resolve the host name as Keatrix level one. Um, so you copy link location. Let's paste it and see what happens. Just get rid of some of this stuff. It just takes you to a test page. So somebody mentioned search exploit. That's the next thing that we're going to cover. Um, and since you all are asking about it, I will cover that. Somebody asked what I was drinking. The answer is Diet Mountain Dew. Sorry. Nothing fun tonight. Okay, let's look at search exploit. So if we type in search exploit, this is built in. This is just like a local repository or store of uh, exploit DB that's already out there. But sometimes you find some, you know, interesting things or it's a quicker way, especially if you're offline to look up some of these attacks. Uh, so I like to search it a few different ways. So say we're looking for the Apache 1.3.20. We could search Apache 1.3.20. And it comes up. That is, to me, very, very surprising. Um, it's not common that it comes up with a specific number like that. Typically, they're a range. And uh, you lose a lot of information, I think, when you search like that. I like to do 1.3, something like that. And you'll see like it has the dot .x through a certain range. And then you really start to pull up some of this information. But let's just say we looked up 1.3.20 specifically. Um, it gives us the exploits in here. So you can see like a file here is in, written in C. This one's written in Perl. Uh, this one is a text document. So when we see it written in Perl, we can assume, uh, not Perl, sorry. If we see it written in Ruby, we can assume that it's probably part of Metasploit because Metasploit modules are written in Ruby. Um, but we could take a look at one of these, say Apache 1.3.20. We could say, we could just cat out that file, user share exploit DB, and I'm pulling this information from right here. And then I'm pulling the rest of it from right here. Exploits, Windows, remote, and then 21204.txt. So we could see what the file says. A vulnerability exists in the default configuration for Apache PHP.exe binary on Microsoft Windows platform. So this doesn't even apply to us. Uh, so we need to gather. This is good, though. This is a good example. Um, this is why we do our research and we see, okay, well, we know we're running an Apache server, but we know we're running on Red Hat. 
Um, so when we look at an exploit like this, we know, okay, well, it says Microsoft Windows platforms. We're not going to be able to run this exploit anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, and that's one that we can ignore. So uh, some other things that we can look at. So we definitely found some interesting things with uh, Apache. We would want to look into the mod SSL, and we'd want to look into... Um, you know, as much as we can in here. So let's see what else there was. Apache, mod SSL, open SSL here as well. So I would say this is our bingo, right? This is one of the, the big bingos is we saw this come up. We saw all the conditions meet with the Red Hat, the 1.3.20 on the Apache, the mod SSL 2.8.4, all really met up and, and worked out. Um, so, all right, let's look up now. Let's, let's back away because we've been at this for an hour. Let's back away from the website just so we can see some other, other things because there was other things on the search. Um, so same procedure though, right? When we're looking up, say, port 22 for SSH, there's a couple things that I, I would want to try here. Now, there is OpenSSH 2.9 P2. We can search exploit this. Uh, we can look this up like you saw with the Apache, and we can go through and see what kind of vulnerabilities are out there for this. Maybe there's something in there that gives us a remote code execution. We can get a shell on the machine. Um, another thing that we do as a, a pen tester is, uh, well, I guess it's in two parts or two reasonings behind it. Uh, at some point, we're going to brute force this SSH. stage. Uh, even if we get remote code execution, we get uh, we get all the wins we want. We still want to uh, attack this SSH. Um, so for the reason that we are um, trying to, you know, trigger their SIM. So if we if we attack their SSH and do a brute force attack, we want to make sure that their SIM is seeing this brute force attack. If their sim is not seeing the brute force attack, we're running this attack and um, they're not catching us, that's bad, right? Uh, another reason here, let's say that we don't have anything, uh, but let's say that we've gathered some usernames and we want to attempt to break in one final way, right? Um, we might brute force the SSH with the usernames we gathered and do password spraying, uh, which we'll talk about when we get more into exploiting in, in hopes of getting some sort of user account on this machine. So it does serve us two purposes. We want to see um, if we can get in, I guess more than two, we want to see if we can get in this method. We want to see if we can get in this method. Um, is it because they have a weak password policy? Is it um, poor user training? Do we find a password that's online? Is it poor password rotation? Um, those are sorts of things to think about. And of course, we're testing their blue team to see how effective they are at catching us when scanning. So as we are, are doing these things as a pen tester, now not as a red teamer, as a pen tester, we are being very, very noisy, very intentionally. We want to make sure that we are, uh, we're happy when we're caught because at least they're, they're catching us on the basics, right? The scanning um, and the, the SSH. Now I've had more in-depth where they say, okay, we've caught you doing that. Can you go back and be more quiet? Uh, we want to see at what level we see you and what level we don't see you. And that starts to become something called purple teaming, where you work with the blue team and you try to uh, really fine tune their SIM. But these are things that I would do on an SSH. I would, I'd would, i brute force it. We'd, we'd have to for all the reasons stated above. We're not going to do that tonight. That falls under exploiting. But the other big, big one that's out here is this 139. Uh, we don't see 445. Typically, that's on Windows machines. But 139 is our Samba share, our SMB. There are so many exploits for SMB. Um, most recently, Windows had the Eternal Blue. That's the big, big one. But you'll come to find over and over again, uh, especially as you study like the older hacking methodologies, the SMB gets uh, banged up quite a bit. So 
we want to look at this and just see what we can find here. And SS or SMB is is always a, a good method for us, especially in internals, for navigating around and getting um, getting shells and, and gaining win. So, but we'll talk about that when we get into internal and Active Directory environments. So when we want to enumerate uh, SMB, the first thing I do is I look at, I say SMB client, and I just want to do a listing. And this is the format that it would be in. So it's a little bit weird due to the escaping, I believe. So I can enter an anonymous login and hit enter on it uh, on the root password. And I can see all the file shares that are existing here. Now, this is a finding. Uh, somebody asked, should we stop using Windows Server as a file server for SMB? Uh, no, you just need to be... Uh, careful with your policy. Policy is more important than anything else. SMB is just a, a way that we navigate. As long as you're patching um, things like Eternal Blue, that's not the big issue. But if we're if we're cracking passwords, and when we get into that, we'll get into it. But if we're cracking passwords and able to uh, get system shells via SMB, then you're going to have an issue because there's other underlying issues. So it's just one part of the problem. Uh, but it's it's a way that we commonly, as a pen tester, navigate around systems. All right. So we have anonymous login here. We're able to see share names. That is a finding in itself. Because we're running kind of short on time, I'm not going to notate every single one of these. If you're still taking pictures and following along, great. Um, I hope you got an idea for how I take notes and how I would screenshot things. Um, so we have a finding here. We could try to connect to one of these, um, these shares. We could see how far this finding goes. So if we tab up and we'll say admin dollar sign, let's just try to connect to the admin and we'll take this, uh, dash L off. So anonymous login successful, we'll hit enter and it'll say wrong password. So at least we don't have access to the admin. Uh, we could try the same thing with the IPC. Okay, we do get into the IPC with an anonymous login. We can LS in here, and we're denied listing on this. Uh, we just type exit. So we can navigate around um, if that opportunity was there for us, but we do have shares that we're able to see, which we shouldn't be able to as an anonymous user. Uh, there was a good tool back in the day that no longer works. It was called Enum. I don't even know if it's on here anymore. Nope, it's not. Enum for Linux. And it does not, uh, it does not work anymore. It's not around anymore. I don't know if it just stopped getting updated or what happened. Um, but, uh, other people are saying they use it. I've found that it's broken with more recent versions of Kali, and I like to stay up to date. So, anyway. It's broken with updated SMB client. There you go. So, one thing I like to do is I like to find out what type of SMB uh, we're running. And that may have come out in the Nessus scan if we come into here. Uh, if we type in SMB, uh, this is gonna be another finding, but we'll talk about this more when we get into internals, this SMB signing not required. Uh, this is one that you need to have on in your Active Directory environments especially, or else we can just relay credentials without ever knowing the password and gain um, shell access to a machine. So we've got service detection. Doesn't specify the SMB. Let me look at the other two real quick. Dialect supported remote host information. Let's see. Uh, I don't think it's gonna actually tell us. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Metasploit. 
So we're going to type in MSF console, and we covered this last time. And remember, we talked about the different features. We talked about auxiliary and exploit. Um, and if you look here, actually, it has the, uh, the exploits, auxiliary, post, payloads, um, actual payloads, encoders, etc. cetera. Um, we're typically going to live in these three We'll use this one if we're doing some sort of, um, well, well, we'll use these as well. Uh, so, but we're going to be focused on auxiliary. What we're going to do is just for fun, we're going to search SMB. And there's a lot of information here. So even if I scroll down, it kind of organizes it by auxiliary, exploit, then post. Post means once we've exploited a machine, exploit is an exploit. We're looking for an auxiliary scanner. I'm gonna just scroll up to show you all the different ones. There's auxiliary admin, there's auxiliary denial service, uh, fuzzers, gather. Oh, I have gotten a, I've gotten an active directory or domain admin off of this guy, believe it or not. Uh, okay. So we're going to be using SMB version. So this guy right here. Auxiliary scanner SMB SMB version. So we're just going to say use and then you can just paste that in. And we're going to say options, set our host, and then again, I am a terrible person and have forgotten the IP address of this machine. It is 192.168.202.130. Okay, and we don't have a domain that we're on, so we don't need to set that. We don't need to supply a user or password because we don't have it. And we'll just hit run. Okay, so it identified it as Samba 2.2.1a. And somebody asked, are we going to solve a hack the box machine after this? That is not the intention. Uh, the intention is to enumerate a hack the box machine after this. Uh, we're not going to be solving because solving requires exploitation. And this week is not on exploitation. Okay, so we've got Samba 2.2.1a. We're going to copy this and let's just do search exploit and see what kind of information we can find. Now, again, you may or may not find something with it when you just type it out like that. No result. I like to do 2.2, something like that. You don't make it too specific again, and you may be able to find something. Um, so it looks like there is a 2.0.x to 2.2. That's not going to work. This 2.2.0 to 2.2.8 trans to open looks interesting. Uh, again, this looks like an NT trans probably falls under that trans to open. There's a bunch of trans to opens here. These ones are all 2.2.8. This 2.2.x trans to open again. And you can see that they're different, um, they're different types. So these are C files. We would have to compile those ourselves. Uh, the Ruby files, again, are likely going to be some sort of Metasploit module already existing. And if we came into here and we just searched trans to open, this is a quick way, too, if you're already in Metasploit. And we say, okay, search trans to open. You see that there is a BSD, a Linux, a Mac OS, and a Solaris. We are on Linux. We could say info exploit Linux Samba trans to open and get some information on this exploit itself. We don't even have to go out to the web to, to see this. So if we look at the description, this, this exploits the buffer overflow found in Samba versions 2.2.0 to 2.2.8. 
This particular module is capable of exploiting the flaw in x86 Linux systems that do not have the no exec stack option set. Some older versions of Red Hat do not seem to be vulnerable since they apparently do not allow anonymous access to IPC. Okay, so we don't know specifically what version of Red Hat we're on. Um, and we don't know specifically if this machine's running x86 or x64. Um, at this point, if this was a production system in a live environment, we would probably call up if we're certain that this uh, could be an exploit that we'd want to run. We would call up the IT manager or whoever is in charge of the project for the client and we'd say, look, I've got an exploit. I want to run it against the machine. Uh, are you giving me permission to do it? Um, as long as there's permission, you don't want to take out like a, a critical server or something and then knock over a network. You know, that's the last thing you want to do is deny service when it's typically out of scope. So as long as you have the permission and they are aware that you're attacking, that would be the next step. So you would fire this guy off and maybe you would get a shell. Maybe you wouldn't. Um, and that's that's really it for for this. I don't want to dive too much deeper. It's it's just about it's about looking at things and digging and digging and digging deeper. Now next week what we're going to do is we're going to go into Keyaptrix again and we're going to start exploiting and then we're going to start um, building our own exploits uh, in terms of modification and com compilation or compiling exploits um, and really gathering how to get those on the web. And then depending on how long I figure out that takes, we might actually dive into uh, another module that I have planned. Uh, so it'll just depend on that. But um, from here, I do want to pick a random box and I want to just do a scan on it. And it may take some time. We may just do an AMA while we're, we're waiting. Um, I'm going to pick a random box. We'll see what comes up for Hack the Box. And then we'll just kind of go from there. So I'm going to close out of this one. Um, I'm going to close out of Durbuster as well. And we'll we'll take this to, to 10 o'clock on the scanning. And then we'll, we'll drop and just go straight to AMA. Um, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. So... If we are going to connect, I need to get on the network. Okay, and let's pick a machine, shall we? Any recommendations? And don't... Uh, don't give me one just because it's ridiculously hard. I'd rather have one that has some decent output. Active. Active is is not uh, active anymore. Unless you just mean an active machine. Hmm. <laughs> we are not doing retired. We're we're going to do active machines for the sole purpose that we're only enumerating. I'm not going to give any inclination if I think something is an exploit. I'm not going to give any ex explanation at all. I'm going to say this looks interesting. This doesn't look interesting. Um, that way you guys don't cheat the system. 127. Everybody's saying 127. All right, we'll do 127. As you can see, I've never done this. I think I'm actually... Am I machined out? I am machined out completely. Look at that. I'm terrible at hack the box. Okay. We'll do this guy. If it's truly against the terms of service, then I'll I'll take the fall for it. I'm not concerned terribly. If they ban me, then they're, they ban me and I lose. I gain $13 a month back, I guess. All right. So we're going to do our scan, T4, all ports. Also, one thing we didn't do that we should do, I just didn't do it because I, I'm aware of what Keyaptrix has to offer. Um... When we're doing these sorts of scans, we should also be scanning on um, 
on UDP as well. So we're going to do SU T4. All, no, not all ports. We'll leave it top 1,000. All ports will take forever. Don't ask me what I was thinking there for a second. I want to run that. Okay, so the quick scan came up with with three. We're gonna change that now to 2280, and it looks like we've got a filtered port of 60,080. Uh, and we're gonna change that to a dash A. So we'll see what that is. Okay, so my my experience doing hack the box, doing capture the flag events, and many, many OSCPs. I don't know if this is correct, but when I see 80 and I see 22, my immediate guess is that you find an exploit on 80 that leads to some sort of credentials. Those credentials will lead you to port 22, which allows you to log in and get a shell. That is not always the case. Sometimes we'll have an exploit on 80 that actually gets us remote code execution, We'll find credentials and then we'll SSH over and uh, get root. Um, there's quite a few paths. The six, 60,000 port up here is also interesting. Um, so, I mean, just, just looking at this from a capture the flag standpoint, my first and big focus is this port 80, especially as this is filtered. Um, so again, it's coming up filtered unknown. We could try to to netcat or telnet to this, which we haven't talked about netcat yet. That's next week. Um, and so it looks like port 80 here. And if we're doing this from a pen tester point of view, again, we're getting server information. Apache HTTPD coming through the server header. It says the page is moved. Okay, so we got a little information, what we see. Um, this will be a finding, right? We talked about that already, information disclosure. So let's just go ahead and go out to the, the website and see what's out there. Okay, it looks like we redirect as soon as we get to the page. Now we've got, uh, we got a page here. Looks like there's a sign up page. It gives you a username and a password, credentials to do SFTP. Your personal homepage will be here. We'll just click around. Looks like we may need to add, and I just closed out of it. We may need to add um, something in our Etsy host to resolve that. Or we make it work ourselves. Um, anyway, let's not get too ahead. Again, I don't want to get into exploits. So a couple things that we're going to look at. We'll view the page source. Uh, looks like they're running Jekyll, which is like a common um, a common blog post type uh, framework, I guess, is typically where I see it. Ah, look, the admin link. So that, that 6080 right here, that port 6080 that just showed up is showing up here. And this is um, showing 127.htb. And when we have something like this, we need to, okay, we just need to modify our Etsy host. And for those of you who are not aware what I'm doing, I'm changing my DNS, local DNS record here. Um, so that way we can access this page when it goes 127.htb. Okay, let's see if we can get to this page in a new tab. Delete that. And it may not work because that port is filtered. Let's see what happens. 
Okay, so 127.htp is now working. Um, so that's good. So there's some, some pages here. We typically want to click through. Uh, sign up today, sign up today. I'll open all these and just see what's going on. Secure SFTP upload. Sounds like there might be a file upload here. Let's click on this and see what this is. So it took us to a page. Okay. It may take up to one minute for all backend processes to identify you. Again, we've got our username. It doesn't ask for the password. We might need to open something like uh, like Burp Suite as well to see what's going on in the request. So that's getting a little ahead of what we need to do. Let's go ahead and minimize this. So let's let's hold the standard here and let's do a, a Nikto real quick on the host. We can also run a Durbuster if we need to. I'm just going to read through the source code real quick while that's running through. That's super cheap, super cheap. It's, if there's one tool that you should have that you have to pay for, it's definitely Burp Suite. Hands down, no doubt about it. I would take Burp Suite over Nessus if Nessus was $400 as well. You just, you have to have Burp Suite. All right, only enable this link if access from trusted networks admin 201.90.212 added localhost admin 2019.02.14. So we're not going to be able to access this. This is why it's filtered. So we found that information as well. So we have to SFTP to this website. Um, we have the personal homepage. We'll open that in the new tab. We'll go here. Maybe not. Let's see if this one works. So that's not working either. Um, so it looks to me, I don't think it's Stego. I, th I think somebody says CLI, I think it is CLI. Um, so it looks to me, and I don't want to give away, so I'm not going to tell you what I what I think is going to happen here. Um, but there is a file upload. If I had to guess, there's a vulnerability in the file upload that allows you some sort of code execution that gets you into um, at least into a, a lower shell you're going to have to somehow get into the admin page at some point in order to get that uh, that full access would be my guess. Um, so when we're looking at this too, all right, let's, let's blow this one up.
Okay, so we found the server again. E tags again. Remember, those are pretty much low findings. I wouldn't put this on a a uh, external report. I'd maybe put it on a web app if I'm desperate. Um, same thing goes for these headers again. And it looks like we aired out um, on the rest of it. So we didn't get a whole bunch of inf information. Everybody's saying we should SFTP through the terminal. Let's do that. All right, we're in. Let's see what options we have. Nothing here. Ah, this is our web page. Does that make sense? So what just happened here? So they gave us uh, they gave us our own personal web page, and they gave us an account to log in via SFTP so that we can upload. Focus on the upload. Um, we are in SFTP, which is in a, uh, a public HTML folder. We have control of what we can upload into this folder. You see this index.html. And it, when we catted it over here, it said nothing, nothing here. Well, what also says nothing here? Our home web page. So if we were to modify this home web page, we could probably put whatever we want. They've got the, the bricks in here and we got a little bit of information disclosure as well. You see they've got the abstract architecture, JPEG. Um, we could try to navigate to this folder area as well. Who knows if it's gonna let us. Okay, so it does give us a, a parent listing here. Um, JavaScript, CSS. So there's a donkey DDoS here. So just just for proof of concept, yeah. Let's uh let's just g edit this file. Let's change this to the the donkey DDoS. I don't even want to look at it. I just want to see what it, what it comes up as. All right, do we have a put? We do have a put, all right. Here goes nothing, guys. Here goes nothing. Hell yeah. We got a donkey now. All right, so we are proving here that we have full control. We have control of an upload of a server that's Apache. Um, uh, that's as far as I can go without saying where I think it goes. Um, I don't want to get into exploitation. But I think I think the logical step, um, I've got a good feeling where the next logical step is. 
So if you are familiar with exploitation, you should your wheels should be spinning here and in, in thinking of where the next logical step is as well. Uh, but for the purpose of not uh, not uh, violating terms of service, I'm not going to go any farther because it's going to require an exploitation attempt to be able to see if I'm correct in my thoughts. Um, and if I am correct, I don't want to dig deeper. Um, so that is an example of enumerating as well. We could also look... Um, that got very capture the flag very quick. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't want to go that route, but the the old hack the box Heath kicked in and, and started diving down that route. Uh, we would wait for the the uh, UDP to come back as well. We're at eighty eight point three, so we'd want to see what's open over there. Um, but we've pretty much pieced together that we've got. Uh, access to upload and modify a web page via this Apache. Um, we could do research on Apache 2.4.25 via search exploit or via Google to see what type of exploits are out there. Um, we could do research on OpenSSH 7.4 P1 to see what's out there. It looks like they're running a Debian based Linux. That's also useful to know. Debian based on Apache. So as much um, as much information as we can gather and apply to a later exploit, the better. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up here as I feel like I can't go any farther. Um, but I see some people are asking about the raffle. All right, we'll do the raffle. Since I'm a nice guy, I'm going to close all this out. Gonna get my pretty face back here in a second. Okay, there are 50 of you in here now. There uh, were maybe 25 when we first started, so I'm going to repeat my raffle spiel. Uh, that's a nice German word for you. And show you exactly what we're dealing with. Again, we are raffling off a bash bunny. It is my bash bunny. You have to, one, be comfortable sending me your address if you win. Two, you cannot um, you cannot win twice in this series, so Gray is eliminated, unfortunately. Um, what else? Let me show you my giveaway one more time. Okay, we're going to raffle. It'll give you the command. It's going to be an exclamation raffle with a space and then the number of tickets you want to purchase. Tickets are 500 a piece, uh, 500 points a piece. You can buy up to 200. Again, nobody has uh, 200 times 500 in points. So you pretty much can spend all your points if you want. We're going to leave it open for five minutes, and then we will do a pick winner. Uh, again, if you're a subscriber, you get a luck multiplier of two. If you're a regular, you get a luck multiplier of two. If we go into the currency... Uh, we could see who the um, highest currency is currently here. But if we go into our settings, you see that you automatically become a regular at 2,000 points. Now, you can risk all of your luck here if you want to. Uh, if you have more than 2,000 points, you're going to get that two times credit on the multiplier. But just know that if you go under 2,000 points, you're going to lose being the regular status and you won't have that moving forward. So... Pick your battles. Um, if you're curious on points again, you get 10 per every 10 minutes or something. I don't remember what it is. Max 120 an hour. So you get 20 per uh, 10 minutes. And you get a bonus if you're a regular. You get a, a sub bonus and nobody's a moderator. But if you're active, talking and chatting, you also get a point. So this is the main way to earn points. You also earn a point if you just hit the follow button. You get 200. Um, you get... 1,000 1, points if you're a subscriber, and that's pretty much it. So that's where currency comes from, and we are going to go ahead and start the giveaway. Where is the giveaway? I am opening it up for everybody.
And also, we can do our AMA right now. But we can, uh, we can wait as well. If you have any questions related specifically to enumeration first, we can start there. All right, J Delta. J Delta's all in. J Delta, you got regular status, you've got subscriber status, and you've got 14 raffle tickets. If you lose, man, I'm disowning you. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Like, this is your moment. Uh, let me, let me drag this over. So here's that test SSL while we wait. This is what Sick in the Mind's been talking about. So it's a command line tool that uh, shows the TLS SSL ciphers. So we just need to, um, we need to download this and then run it. So, Uno Memento. We'll run that while we wait. Not save it? I guess not. Why am I not saving this? GitHub. All right. Oh, it's a directory. Duh. Okay. Do we just give it a URI? Perfect. Thank you, Coffee. I appreciate that. All right, we'll do report HTML, like he says, and then we'll do the IP address of Keoptrix, which I've already forgotten. I think it's 202.130. Run and gun. All right, let's pull up the giveaway while we wait. 12 seconds, 12 seconds. There's not a lot of you in this. I'm surprised. All right. I'm telling you, J Delta, if you don't win, dude, you're disowned. All right. 
going to pick the winner. It's Ayeo. What did you, how many did you put in for? I don't even see it. I took you out. Just one. Damn. Damn, J-Delta. All right, shoot me, if you're, if we're not friends, shoot me a friend request on Twitch and then we'll, uh, we can DM. Sorry, J Delta. Yeah, I'm gonna add you a friend. Let me see if I can whisper. There we go. Shoot me your Addy. All right, let's take a look at this report, shall we, people? That's not it. Thanks for the sub, Cyberbits. That's cool. It does server banners in here as well. Shows vulnerabilities. That's nice. It's actually really cool. Do I run Windows as my main OS? I do. All right. I am here. It is AMA time. Thanks, J Delta. Yeah, Windows clients uh, specifically for gaming. Why am I so beautiful? I don't know. Thank you, Jake. You melt my heart. It's the beard, Jake. It's the beard. Not mine. It's yours. I can't grow one like yours. I have a new car. Yeah, it's a it's a Lego Bugatti. My wife built it. I built very very little of it. You're very observant. How old am I, bra? I am 29. Take a screenshot of this address. All right. I did see the full size Lego Bugatti. It went like two miles an hour, but it was really cool. Super cool. 
How can you solve hack the box and other CTFs? It's just repetition, man. It's just, you start to recognize patterns. Like if you saw, you saw how I observed that when I looked at it, right? Like I saw port 80, port 22, which is really common for capture the flags. Uh, so I knew right away that there's probably an exploit on port 80 that's going to log us into 22, or at some point we're logging in 22 to get some sort of shell. Uh, you start to notice patterns like that, or you get little hints on the uh, on the names for Hack the Box. Just watch watch videos and in, in write ups for those. For Capture the Flags, just read write ups. Um, but the the best way to do it is to immerse yourself in a Capture the Flag and try all the problems that you can. Solve the ones you can, that's great. If you can't solve it, go back and read the write-ups after the fact and figure out where you could have improved and, um, and what the correct answers were. That'll help you a lot. What sort of stuff did they have you doing day-to-day -day working help desk? Uh, I did anything and everything. So when I first started, it was just taking... You know, it's just taking tickets, like uh, like calls on the phone kind of thing. So just depending on, on as something as small as a password reset or to, to some major troubleshooting if we had it. Eventually, I moved into uh, level two where I was doing on-site work, uh, whether that be installations or um, hardware replacement, uh, you know, just different type of troubleshooting uh, than you know, the system level troubleshooting, it's actually hardware troubleshooting. Um, after that, I moved into more of a network kind of position. So we would do more of auditing of their network, uh, their security posture, see what kind of, you know, um, we basically had a checklist and we would go in and if they weren't in compliance, we would put them into compliance or we would ask them or have some sort of notation as to why they weren't. Uh, so I got to see quite a bit of things. The only thing I really... I didn't get to touch a lot that I wish I did was the sysadmin side. We had like a set sysadmin who would go in and um, build out all the domains and set all that up. You know, I got to watch a few times, but it takes more than a few times of setting up domains to really, really get it. So um, he was by far, you know, a, a Windows domain genius. And I was, I was a little jealous of that. Any thoughts on the SANS holiday hack challenges ever jumped into any of them? I have not jumped into any of them. I know people that like them, but I couldn't give you much feedback about it. The, the write-ups are always interesting to read. Do you find Maltico helpful at work or on your own? So I know social engineering people that say Maltico is good. I never use it personally. Doesn't mean that's not useful. Um, I, I feel like there has some nuances to it or some, I guess, some perks that uh, maybe make it easier in one or two things, but I feel like I can pretty much gather most of the information myself through other methods. Do I recommend anything to learn web app? Uh, yeah, so the web application hacker's handbook, any videos that you can find out there, any bug bounty write-ups that you can find are good. Um, my biggest leap into web app was eLearn Security's uh, web penetration testing course. So if you can afford that, if not, uh, a book in watching videos, reading write-ups is, is probably a good way to start as well. What does the blue team do to fix the issues you present them with? Uh, we don't work with the blue team a lot of the time. So um, we're it's it's a fine line for us too. like we make recommendations but we don't make implementations and we don't make um we don't make specific recommendations like in terms of software because we don't want to become off bias or anything in terms of like we're pushing certain things um so we'll be very specific if there's like a setting that you can change uh we'll we'll walk you through it but you're the one who has to click the button kind of deal At the, in the end it's a liability as well um uh, in terms of like sitting down with a blue team, uh, you can sit there and say, you know, like, hey, I just ran this exploit. Did you see me? Or, hey, I just ran this. Did you see me? You know, and then you really try to fine tune what sort of traffic's coming through and how they can baseline those attacks.
but they're on their own. You give the report. Typically, you don't work with the blue team to, to fix the issues. They do their own. Thanks, Jake. It's nice having you here. Do I think your coworkers are jealous? Old coworkers? You recently got your OSCP and they told everyone you couldn't do an MMAP scan. Could you do an NMAP scan at the time? Maybe there was some truth to it. I don't know. They might be jelly. Who knows? You can do it. <laughs> Just giving you a hard time, MTX. One question. Do you use Empire and Metasploit side by side? For example, I managed to get on the box with Eternal Blue, but if I manage that, what benefits would I have trying Empire along with it? Um, I do not use Empire. I've tried Empire. I find it finicky. Some people live and die by it. I am, I'm more of a live and die by Metasploit than I am by an Empire. If you find an Eternal Blue, my recommendation would be to instead of using a generic shell, if that's what it uses, to upgrade that to a meterpreter shell. And then you have loads of flexibility. You've got, um, depending on what type of environment you're on, you can load in like incognito if you're on Active Directory, uh, Kiwi, Mimikatz, depending on the architecture. Uh, there's a lot of tools in there that you can load. You can load PowerShell directly into uh, meterpreter shell. Uh, you can upload, download files. You can run post exploit attacks. There's all kinds of stuff if you've got the right kind of shell. So. Hey, thanks, Sasha Khan. I appreciate that. So you're trying to experience Mimi Cast, but you're on a normal shell. Yeah, just improve the, the payload, change it to... Uh, Change it to a meterpreter shell and you should be fine. You should be able to load Mimi Cats. You guys are still on this port hack thing. I wish there was a port hack. Yeah, port hack is from uh, from Hacknet. We were playing Hacknet earlier for a little bit. How much pen testing is going to get automated? Uh, I feel like a lot of pen testing is already automated, but you still need the the person behind it. You know, like that's never going to go away. You can automate a lot of the things that you do and make your life easier, uh, but you still need the person to actually do the hacking in the the long run. So Hacknet is very point and click. It is a little, it's a little boring. It's a little repetitive. I feel like they were showing another game that looks a little bit more realistic. I don't, I don't know how realistic it is, but it's, it's close to 40 bucks. So I'm not going to purchase that. If it was free, like Hacknet is, that'd be a different story.
Uh, what is the game called? It is called Night Team 4. N-I-T-E space Team space 4. Am I going to Carolina Con all three days? Um, maybe. I don't know yet. So obviously I'm going Friday. I'm going Saturday because we're doing the CTF. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going on Sunday. So the only thing is on Sunday, my my old manager, like as of two weeks ago, he was my manager, is giving a talk. So I'll probably go just to support him. Um, and it depends, I guess, how well I'm doing in the, uh, in the capture the flag event. If we're doing poorly, then I probably won't, uh, probably won't be there very long. So, but if we have a, a crown to defend, then maybe. The issue that we have, I think, I don't know. Okay, so there's going to be three of us on the team. I don't know the other guy that's going to be there, but I don't think there's anybody that's really good at reverse engineering. So that's going to be uh, it's going to be hard if we get reverse engineering challenges. It's definitely a possibility. Do you need to be in a team? I don't think so. We're just going to do it as a team. Collective minds and stuff, you know. Hacker Evolution is 99 cents. I don't even know what Hacker Evolution is. Is it also a terrible video game? Chess Stats, The Punisher. You can see. Sorry, it's in, in reverse when I pull it. I strip for tattoos. I never watched Venom, but Endgame's coming out in two days so there's that i've not bought tickets i don't have to see it day one be waiting for a while maybe
That's insane. I feel like they're just going to go capture all the uh, infinity stones or whatever and try to turn back time. And if that's literally what happens, I will be sad. Fighting got generic with Thanos. It was okay. I'm more concerned with who's going to die in Game of Thrones this week than who's going to die in Endgame this week. Just saying. They keep talking about the crypt. How many times can they talk about that? There's so many, so many statements in that whole thing that they're just like, yeah, this, these people are all going to die. Again, I won't, I won't give any spoilers out but the the first two episodes have been uh they've been a bit underwhelming but they've been i guess story building hey action What type of device is that? Skip right to the CISSP. If they've got four or five years of experience, but uh, most people taking the Security Plus don't have four or five years of experience. And some DOD 8570 require that uh, Security Plus anyway. No luck with Meterpreter? Did you try are there staged and unstaged payloads? I don't I don't know off the top of my head. We can bring uh we could bring Callie back up. Hold on. All right, we MSF console. And it's use exploit windows SMB MS 17010 eternal blue, right? Uh Options. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So I'm not going to set an R host. So we'll set the payload. I do have the path memorized. Uh, 
We'll say exploit. Maybe if it works. Windows. Okay, sorry. So Windows. X64, Meterpreter, they're all right here. And you're going to want the reverse TCP. You could also try a bind TCP. Sometimes that works. Which one were you using? Which payload? Yeah, try the bind, see if that works. Also, um, depending what you're doing, you might need to reboot the or reset the machine and know that uh, Eternal Blue fails uh, a lot, <laughs> quite a bit. Sometimes it'll fail a few times in a row before it actually works. So those are a couple things to think about. It's a very finicky exploit. Why does it fail like that? I don't know. I'm not a, uh, I guess I'm not very knowledgeable on the exploit itself in terms of the depth behind the reasoning. We could Google it. See if I can find it. I don't think it's poor code. Bye, Coffee No Man. It's great having you here. Appreciate you being here. Let's see if there's info on it. Here you go. This exploit, like the original, may not trigger 100% of the time and should be run continuously until triggered. It seems like the pool will get hot streaks and need a cool down period before the shells rain in again. This module will attempt to use anonymous login. So the pool is referring to the kernel pool. The kernel pool is groomed so that the overflow is well laid out to overwrite the SMBV1 buffer. Yeah, if you're seeing a fail like that, it's it's common that it's, I mean, like, it's common to see a few fails in a row. It, can you reset the box? I don't know what you're doing. If you're doing, like, hack the box or whatever, can if you can reset it, just reset it. Somebody said it needs time for the buffer to free. That sounds logical.
Bye, Gray. Yeah, I'm probably doing a hard stop at 10.30 tonight. So if you got any questions, hit your boy up. So can you reboot the Metasploitable 3 solo? Only reason I say that is, uh, is since you triggered it before, it may just be stuck. You may have to reboot and let it trigger again. What did I say last time that I had a hard stop or was doing a hard stop? Yeah. So the issue is you guys, you guys uh, wait until like a minute before and then you hit me with the questions. We'll sit here for the next 11 minutes and you'll wait till for 10 minutes to actually hit me with something, get me talking, and then I lose track of time again. So I blame each and every one of you. When explaining scenarios and interviews, uh, do you typically explain specific commands used like flags and everything? Hell no on the flags, man. There's just no way on the flags. Like, if I'm asked about flags, and it's rare that you are, I think it's kind of cruel to ask about that because unless it's something very like, like what are your nmap flags, you know, something very, very common. Um, it's honestly... It's something where you say, you know, I'll, I just, I know the tool, but I'll have to Google the flags or I know, uh, I know I've used it before. So I'll say history pipe grep the command, you know, I do that with SQL map all the time. I use SQL map all the time, but I still can't remember all the stupid risk settings and, uh, and everything. So I go back in there and I'll, I'll history grep SQL map to see what I ran before. Um, so no on the flag things, I wouldn't worry too much about that. And explaining scenarios and in interviews. So I again, it's not specific commands, it's more of tools. Um, so like if I'm having an interview and they say, well, tell me your internal methodology, I would say, well, um, I would start up responder first thing, you know, for doing LLMNR poisoning. And I'm going to kick off a Nessus scan right after that because Nessus generates a lot of traffic and uh, Responder is going to pick up a lot of traffic when that starts kicking off. So I'll let that run. And, uh, you know, while that's going, I'll do X, Y, and Z as well. So you just kind of have to have a methodology of what you're doing. Uh, but as, in terms of specifics, I don't think so. Just knowing the tools is fine. Reboot did the trick. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, what's your thoughts about microservices? Does isolating each component linked to a single website offer additional security? I don't even know if I've seen a microservice. If you want to go more detail, 
Um, please feel free. I don't, I don't know if I know enough to even talk about it. So if you want to give me an example, maybe I just never heard it called microservice before. Hey, Gibbets. What does Nessus do while Responder is doing its magic? Uh, yes, you're capturing hashes, but you're poisoning requests, right? So when you're when you're using Nessus, you're generating all kinds of traffic, and some of that traffic is going to be uh, causing communication on the network. You're going to be able to sit there in the middle during some of like these broadcast requests that are going out, and you're going to start poisoning them. Um, so that's what Responder does. Responder is also better to use in the morning or when coming back from lunch than it is to use at like 11 o'clock, for example, or 11 a.m. or like 3 p.m. You want it when people are just getting on their machines or just getting back from their machines. Because you need traffic, exactly. So we're going to use Responder when we get into the internal and you're going to see that it's a dead zone. We're going to actually have to force Responder to, um, to communicate to us as a proof of concept. You're setting a personal goal to try to get OCP in six months. Any must-have material you like to recommend? Uh, so here, here is my personal thing about the OSCP. If you feel comfortable with Linux and you feel comfortable with, um, with networking, it doesn't have to be in-depth, but just comfortable, I, I think you should purchase the OSCP. I would purchase 90 days. Uh, everything that you need to know is in the OSCP. Like it, it's there. Yeah, they're vague about it, but everything you need to know is there. Um, as long as you have the time to put forward, uh, the money obviously to purchase the 90 days and uh, the effort, then it shouldn't be an issue with going in with pretty much little hacking knowledge to begin with. Um, I went in pretty much a zero and came out passing in 45 days. So, I mean, you just have to be able to, to put forth that effort um, in terms of material, I've posted them around. There's uh, Joe Perry has a, a course at Cyberary on Python. I think th that's good to just refresh on some Python or at least know some Python if you don't because uh, you will see a little Python in the OSCP. And then the Georgia Weidman course on Cyberary is very, very outdated, but uh, it lines up really well with the OSCP because the OSCP is kind of outdated too. So um just watch those while you're in that waiting period. You know, it usually takes like two weeks to start your, your coursework anyway. Um, and kind of watch those, understand the concepts. You don't even have to understand exactly what's going on, just the concepts, and you should be okay. Somebody said virtual hacking labs. I've been hearing nothing but good things on virtual hacking labs lately, so... I uh, I don't have personal experience, but I've heard lots of good things. You don't personally crack the hashes. You should crack the hashes on the uh, on the responder hashes. Those are so much money, so much win on those hashes. SMB relay is iffy. It's it's cool to to do if you can get it done, but you get so much more value with a cracked hash. Plus, you have a story to tell about their password policy. So um, your, your friend told you to buy the OSCP now as well. Don't second guess yourself. Just purchase it and force yourself to learn it. That's the best way to do it. Just buy it and don't even think about it. Should you try Volnhub systems for the OSCP? You don't have to. Um, there's the list out there by Abachi who's, who's got the uh, similar systems on Volnhub to the OSCP. Uh, it's worth a try, but I mean, everything, again, that you're going to learn in the OSCP, the material has everything you need. Uh, the rest is doing outside research on the enumeration portion. They'll they'll give you the tools, a lot of the tools that you can use in the, the labs or whatever. Um, it's all going to come down to enumeration. And that's why, like, today's lesson was so important. It's not, it's not knowing specifically, you know, what tools to use, but being able to Google and dig around and be patient 
uh, in order to find the right things. I went from zero to here in 45 days. Yeah, it took me 200 hours over 45 days. Um, I still had 45 days left over in my labs when I passed my exam. I got through like 35 machines, I think, 33 or 35. I don't remember what the, the number was. It was somewhere in the 30s. So somebody's commenting on machines in the labs. My thought process is once you pass the 30 machine mark, uh, you should start looking at taking your exam. Uh, I also recommend taking your exam midway through. Some Similar to what I did, at least leave some time on your exam. or Because you don't want to purchase lab time and another exam. It's just easier to pay $60 and still have your lab time left over. Uh, plus you, you know... You get that experience of going through it once, even if you have a bad experience. If you pass, you pass. Thanks, Vita. I appreciate that. Yeah, you don't have to pay for the exam if you renew, but you're paying that extra money to renew. It's only 60 bucks to uh, do a retake. Do you have to be on the webcam for the whole 24 hours while testing? Yeah, as, as long as you are actively testing, you have to be on the webcam. You can request a break and go walk around or do whatever. I am not... Uh, I am not part of that test group. I got my OCP before they started doing that. So. Whether or not proctoring is the correct method, I don't know. I think that the proctoring was implemented as a patch to not having um, not having up-to-date exams. That's where the cheating comes in, right? Because everybody knows the answers and passes them around kind of deal. Uh, that's how it's easy to have somebody take an exam for you. If you're updating your material regularly, you're not going to have as much uh, on the dumping side. But I don't disagree with proctoring because I've had exams where I take from home where they're proctored as well. Um it's just there's there's ways to bypass it too it's just i i don't think it was implemented for for the reasons that they lead on about it yeah somebody would could sit in the exam for somebody else as well that's true Can you link the TJ null post? Yeah, you can link the TJ null post. That's fine. Any suggestions on MCSA and server administration? I don't know enough about uh, Microsoft certs. Are you trying to be a pen tester when you grow up? I don't know if anything past the MCSA is going to be useful. Gotcha, Ion. Um, I mean, they they do that now, right? Like you can have an app server and you can have a database server, and then you have the web the web front. It doesn't mean that you can't that your web front doesn't have to communicate to the app server that doesn't have to communicate to the SQL server. Um, and you can still exploit one and get to the back end of the other, or you know, vice versa. So. 
I don't know if that's really adding any sort of defense. And it gets really tricky because what what's in the DMZ and what's not in the DMZ? Your SQL server is probably not in the DMZ. Your web server is probably in the DMZ. But if your SQL server is injectable from the web server in the DMZ, then you're still accessing that that SQL server that's sitting inside the network, right? You can bypass a whole server that's sitting out there. It is past my hard stop at 30. Uh, do we find SQL Server running on different hosts? I typically find SQL Server running on the same host. It doesn't mean that it it's, doesn't go the other way like I was just talking about. Am I going to take the AWAE? I am not. I am working on the EWPTX right now. I don't foresee me doing two advanced web app certs. So. Correct. You Most of the time you're on some sort of replicated QA dev environment. Hardly ever do you test live, but it happens. Live testing is just so dangerous. How are the eLearn courses? I think eLearn courses are fantastic. I've got some nitpicky stuff about how they run their labs, but that's just me being nitpicky. I think it's cool that you can start your exam pretty much whenever you want right away. And I mean, it's... The exam was pretty decent, the one I took already. Um, I've, I've heard that the WPA, WPTX exam is pretty hard. So, What are some successful study habits that I practice? Um, so the one thing that I really, really like to do is I like to, if I'm going to take a certification... I like to set a, a date for that certification, right? So I'll purchase the voucher uh, and use the voucher, schedule the exam for a specific date. That way I have my goal. So if I start procrastinating and that date gets closer, then okay, I know I need to put my ass into gear and start working on, uh, on studying for that. So I'm having the same situation right now with the WPTX. My voucher expires on the 15th of May and I may be one third of the way through the course. So I need to get my ass in a gear and get ready for that exam because uh, I am taking that exam on the 15th regardless of uh, being ready or not. So that's a good study habit. And, you know, just for me, as long as I'm interested in the topic, I find it really easy. So it's like work is constant studying, but work is also fun for me. And the same same thing goes for like when I'm doing this or when I'm uh, just researching on my own. It, it never feels like work. So um, if if you can make studying not feel like it's work, like you're actually enjoying learning, it's really makes it a lot easier as well. Do I work for a company? Yes, I work for a company. I do consulting. So external consulting, meaning we have many, many clients. Think like uh, an MSP would. Which I think is the proper route to go first. There's always uh, time later to go internal and work internal. And, you know, but you see way more interesting stuff on the external side because you get to see all different kinds of environments and setups, etc. Once you go internal, you're seeing a bunch of the same stuff repeatedly. Good night, Ion. Yeah, exactly. If, if there's a practice test available, doing the practice tests, 
Um, those are good study habits. Flashcards, if flashcards work for you. I'm a visual learner. Um, I like, like, I hate to read, absolutely hate to read. So if there's a video on it, I'll watch the video, I'll take notes, I'll go do it myself. I, I'm hands on. Um, so it's definitely, uh, it's definitely the way I learn. Some people like to just sit down and, you know, get into a book and learn that way. That's fine as well. You just got to really find the materials that's good for you. But yeah, I 100% agree with the, uh, the practice tests. If you can practice tests, uh, as you get into these like hacking certs, they're more of, uh, you know, like a practical. So it becomes less and less on the, the practice test side of things. An MSP is a managed service provider. Somebody mentioned that, but basically, um, say like you do all the IT work for a company if you're an MSP. So they'll hire you, you take over their IT work, you'll be their help desk, you'll fix their computers, you'll set up their domain controller, et cetera. So MSPs will have like a hundred clients where they do this for. Uh, you can think of pen testing almost in the same frame of mind where we have hundreds of different clients, um, each of them a little bit different, right? So you see different environments, different things to do, where if you went and worked, say like, just as an example, like Wells Fargo, if you did just worked at Wells Fargo as a pen tester, you're either one pen testing their applications on their server, or you are two doing like red team work where you're going and pen testing their, uh, like maybe their banks or like, uh, you know, trying to social engineer your way into those sorts of situations. Or maybe you're doing um, engagements where you're you're doing scanning against the network and you're uh, doing exploits internally, but you're not, you're going to get, used to seeing the same stuff over and over and over and over. Um, so I, there's not as much flexibility in the tools. If that makes sense. See, you guys ask all the questions. Actually, you guys have been asking questions from the get. Ever since I uh, I said that, you guys have asked pretty pretty good questions. You get me talking. I'm already ten minutes past my hard stop. How old was I when I got out of help desk? Uh, let's let's think about that. I started my first help desk job when I was 25 and a half. I got out of help desk when I was almost 27. I did almost a year and a half in help desk. I did nine months in a network position and then I became a pen tester. So I became a pen tester when I was 28. Took about two years to go from help desk to pen test. Buy MTX. I liked my help desk job because it was so fast paced. And then I went government and the government was so slow paced. Night and day. Yeah, if you're 22 and an information senior information consultant already, that's good, man. There's a lot of young up and coming rock stars. Like there's a guy that drops in sometimes here that's 18 with a CCMP, so already working as a network engineer. If we called this help desk to pen test. Uh, people would be expecting help desk solutions and that we are not providing. Yeah, the CCMP might be straightforward, but he's still 18 and he's still a network engineer at 18. That's impressive.
All right. Two minute deadline. Two minute warning. Any last great question? Rapid fire round robin. Yeah, I'd debate if going, if I would go back to college again, if I could repeat that situation. I think I would, but I think I would do it for computer science. And be smarter uh, with the way I took out loans. Favorite cyber or tech hacking movie? I don't know if I have a favorite hacker movie. Mr. Robot's good. I haven't seen the, the last season, though. I know that doesn't count as a movie. Yeah, I hear I need to see season three. All right, my people. Clock is turning in three seconds. All right. We are done. I am done. You guys have been awesome. Sorry that uh, J Delta didn't win. Congratulations again to those who won. Uh, I will see you guys next week when we cover exploits. I'll send out an email with what we're going to be doing. It's going to be more Keoptrix um, and probably going to be something else in there i'll have to throw in there so thanks guys appreciate it i'll catch you guys in a little bit